Okay, thank you very much, uh, Maria. <clears throat> You've been a great friend for many years. Also, Elena, I see Armando Perez, and many <laughs> other friends. In fact, I went to school in Cuba with Armando for a while. Um, so I'm honored to be here, and uh, I have a lot of uh, information to impart, uh, so I will talk fast, but that's no problem for a Cuban, right? <laughs> so I will talk very briefly about my links with the organization, which began seven years ago in February. And right here at Casa Bacardi, I came, and uh, I will talk very briefly about that. And then I will talk about three main waves of research we have seen. First, when the, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed. Then, of course, when Fidel got sick and transferred power to his brother. And now that Obama has his new policies, which I have some problems with, but I don't think I know everything. But, but I'm going to be a little bit critical. And then um, I'm going to say what people are asking me. A lot of people are asking me questions. Of course, they are asking me questions because I have a background in economics and in infrastructure. But I think the questions that people are asking me are interesting for you to know. Because to answer all those questions, I need to work with engineers. And then what are the priority research areas? So as I mentioned, uh, seven years ago, I came here. Theo Babung invited me to come. And he organized these two associations, plus the ingenieros, agronomos, y azucareros. And basically, at the time, there was a lot of interest in uh, wh what can the engineers do to be part, because everybody was thinking that this government was going to collapse and so on. So I said, well, what, the way I have been able to participate is because I wrote papers, which I will talk about. So I was in AID at the time, the head of the infrastructure office, but not working on Cuba. And the reason why I worked on Cuba is because people read my papers. In fact, let's say seven or eight years ago, if you Google Cuba infrastructure, I would have like three papers among the top 10 and even today, if you do Cuba power sector, number one paper is still an old paper of mine. I cannot understand that, quite frankly. So there's a need to do more work on power, because my paper is too old. <coughs> OK, so basically, I'm going to talk about three waves. The first wave was 1990. I love to see pictures of uh, communist people sort of falling down and children playing on top of them. I have a collection of statues of uh, of uh, Lenin and Stalin all toppled down. This is the nicest one because I see these kids playing on top of it. Uh, so basically, uh, the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy was mentioned. That's when it was founded because many of the founders and initial members, initially we were like 50 or so, we have been working for AID, for the World Bank, for the IMF in Russia and all these countries that were transitioning. So people said, well, we have been doing it in other places. We should start doing this, um, you know, thinking about Cuba. And in fact, I used to follow Cuba, but I never wrote a single paper on Cuba until ASCII, more or less, got me interested. And I wrote on different topics. So, uh, uh, I mean, I wrote a first paper I wrote was on the transition from war to peace in El Salvador and the lessons that could come from that for Cuba. But at one point, I read a paper, actually, by Manolín Cerejo. He told me he's coming around 9.30. But I read a paper by him that talked about how in Cuba they used uh, petroleum. They burned Cuban petroleum in the power plants. And that's ruined many of the power plants. And then I saw from his paper that because of that, the reserve margin was quite reduced. So I said, wow, this is going to cause blackouts. So then I started studying this more. And I presented a paper at ASCII. And I was presenting it, like, say, on a Wednesday. And there were blackouts in the island on that weekend. So everybody was coming to my session. So then, of course, we know that Periodo Especial, Cuba went down. It was awful. Even people went blind. Some people think because of lack of nutrition. So it was really terrible. But then they were saved by Venezuela. And um, there is a very eminent uh, Cuban economist, Carmelo Mesa Lago. And he says that maybe it's up to 10 billion that Cuba is receiving from Venezuela. So in a way, uh, they bailed them out. 
And then, of course, in uh, 2006 was another wave. And up to then, I was working on Cuba since the founding of the association. For, so I was working on Cuba for 15 years, but really on the weekends and doing it on my own and so on. Uh, but then when uh, that happened, I started spending maybe uh, 20 or 40% of my time. And I came numerous times to Miami. I worked with Southcom. I went, to, sometimes I spent two, three weeks at a time with Southcom. And I um, was very involved at the time. So now we go to the third stage, you know? And here we have, a, this was at a party at the White House. That's a Cuban cigar, supposedly. But in any case, um, this is an exact quote from Obama, you know? change is going to come, and basically a premise is if economic activity goes up and so on, there's more wealth, people will claim for democracy. But quite frankly, that is not true. At least it's not based on historic experience. Because all the countries that have changed from communism to a liberal democracy have done so because they have been suffering. And that's what happened in Russia and what happened in the, in the other countries. So we have the counterfactual of uh, Vietnam and China who opened up the economy, and actually they, became, they continue to be repressive, they continue to be communists. So China used to be a poor communist country and now it's a rich, com rich communist country that still continues to repress, it still continues to create trouble all over the world. So here I have some things which I put in red, which are to me almost certain, and I put in black some things that are more speculative. No? So I think definitely we see every day that Venezuela is collapsing economically and politically. That's a fact. It's very difficult to think that Venezuela can continue to give so many billions to Cuba, when the poor people of Venezuela don't have toilet paper, they don't have milk. Uh, so it, it's bizarre, but maybe, maybe Cuba controls Venezuela so much that it's possible, but it seems to me not likely. Now, without subsidies, definitely Cuba would begin another periodo especial. No? It would be a hit uh, to lose $10 billion. And the thing that I'm very... Uh, you know, because in a way, uh, Cuba has always had, uh, for many years, they received petroleum from the Soviet Union, and now they receive petroleum from, uh, from Venezuela. So in a way, they don't, in a way, put an, an economic value. Uh, my papers on Cuba that is in, uh, is in Google and all the papers I wrote after that is really looking at the finances or the electric company, uh, the Cuban electric company. And it can only survive because they get petroleum at zero cost. So I think if that were to happen, another period especial, and this is sort of speculative, but I really think that when Obama says, okay, we want to do this because opening up is a very good way to promote change, I think basically the U.S. government doesn't want the government of Cuba to collapse. That's my own view. I mean, I, I'm just speculating. No? That's why I put it in black. But I don't think the U.S. government wants to see riots in Cuba, collapse of public order, and then Marielle too. That worries. So I think that's the real reason. And then also, I think also, you know, Obama wants to have a legacy. He has two years in office. Things he can do without going to Congress, that's one of them, makes him popular. And one thing is that I'm certain, and I have done a paper on the fiscal situation in Cuba, anything that deals with tourism, foreign investment, all that goes, the Cuban oligarchy skims those profits. So that money goes to this uh, Cuban writer, Zoe Valdez, that I follow. She's an intellectual that used to live in Paris, now lives in Miami. She said, people are talking about the transition. The Escanel, the transition she says the transition already took place. The children and grandchildren of the Castros are now running the most profitable companies in Cuba. And that's sort of their dream, I think, to pass to their children. 
So what are people asking me? Of course, this comes from the fact that I'm an economist. So they're saying, what are the, these are people from the Congress, some of the Cuban American congressmen, they're interested in knowing what are the real effects of opening up the economy? How much money will they get additionally? How much of that money will go to the people in power? I would argue that a lot of it will go to the people in power. And I'm trying to work those numbers. Now the other question is what happens immediately if Venezuela reduces or cuts subsidies? Now will there be blackouts? If there are blackouts, there are water shortages because the pumps cannot run and so on. And then uh, this is a different topic because the U.S. government is sponsoring, um, trying, the U.S. government has a, a, an energy plan for the Caribbean, because remember, Cuba is not the only one that gets money from Venezuela. Haiti, all those little islands, Dominican Republic, they're all getting subsidized petroleum. So people planning, people in the U.S. government are saying, well, at least they're gonna cut these people. Maybe not Cuba, but they'll cut these other ones. So how can these countries survive if they don't get the subsidized petroleum from Venezuela? Well, one possibility is to move from liquid fuels to gas. As you know, uh, you know generating power through liquid fuels is the most expensive way. Uh, on the other hand, uh, gas is cheaper. But of course, uh, gas requires certain size. So the IDB has a new study showing how you how a conversion from liquid fuels to gas could happen in the Caribbean. And the study doesn't include Cuba, but of course, uh, Cuba would be a very important part of it. So I think that's a very interesting research topic for people here who work on engineering is what are the uh, steps, what are the financial issues, what are the engineering issues? involved in moving from uh, liquid fuels to gas in the Caribbean. So those are the main questions. Now, you, you notice a lot of these questions are not project specific. They are more uh, system-wide specific, and that could be because of my background. This is based on what people are really asking me. So people are not asking me, is this plan, would this plan be a good one? Will this part of the highway is the one that should be fixed? Now they're asking more or less, would this thing collapse or not? If it collapses, what would happen? So people, but here in infrastructure, most infrastructure is networks. So in a way, I always think that we cannot look at infrastructure piece by piece, but we have to think about, definitely power sector is like that. And water, to some extent, is like that. Okay. So this is what uh, I was saying before, that I, I could not answer, even begin to answer those questions without working with engineers. I should have said that while I'm an economist, in my entire career, I have always worked with uh, engineers. And at the World Bank, at the IDB, and then at AID, I was the head of the infrastructure office. So within that office, there was a division where all the engineers of AID were, all the ones that were in Washington. So, and let's say at the World Bank or IDB, engineers always work with uh, economists and financial people because they have to show that this is viable not only from the engineering point of view, but also from the financial point of view uh, because otherwise the project is not bankable. So I think you need to work more and I'm uh, ready to, I've always been work, ready to work with your, I think the best uh, example of cooperation was with Manolin Cedejo where he gathered a lot of engineering information and I gather, I basically put financial and economic numbers to his physical numbers, let's say. So I think there's a lot of scope for doing that. And at one time I was encouraging uh, the engineering associations to maybe reach out to the economists at the University of Miami, but I understand they were quite busy and so on. Now I'm quite willing to work with anyone who wants to work in this area because now I'm really actually retired, so I uh, have more time to do that. And um, well, two years ago, I did a PowerPoint uh, presentation in this group, but I did it, it was a voice over PowerPoint. 
So I was in Washington in the cold. So this time I was able to come. So uh, I, I thank you because it motivated me to come here in the summer. And yesterday I kayaked from uh, Virginia Key to, to uh, Vizcaya, no? and I have a picture to show to anyone. Oh, okay, here my thing is beeping. Okay, this is, uh, uh, so I did my 15 minutes. Now, I think the priority is power because if the subsidies were to stop, the immediate impact would be on the power sector, and this immediate impact on the power sector would hit the uh, water sector. And then I, I have a client right now, a private client, he wants to invest in Cuba. I, I give him numbers, and I also told him if I were you, I would not invest. So he congratulated me. He said, uh, you're an honest consultant, otherwise you would be stringing me along. I said, look, I have to tell you the truth, no? Uh, so I'm not particularly interested in going to work in Cuba at this point. So that's, I, I, I don't, if you want to go, you go. I'm not a dogmatic person. So if any of you want to go and work in Cuba, it's fine with me. I'm just saying that I don't feel that right now I want to go. Right, so, but if you want to go, it's fine with me. But I think it would be good, it would not hurt anyone to invite Cuban engineers, economists, and so on to come here and participate in these things. Uh, because I think uh, we have more to win than anybody, I think. So that would be my uh, recommendation. And I'm sure you have other ideas that I would like to discuss with you. But uh, my beeper told me I uh, just passed my uh, 15 minutes uh, 30 seconds ago. <laughs> so sorry. 